Hey y'all, <clears throat> that should be my Facebook folks coming on. How you doing? And waiting on Periscope. You wouldn't believe the stuff that's happened <laughs> to me in the last week. And I've even had to uh, flip the devices I'm doing my broadcast on because my Periscope app on my phone there we go. Hello, Periscope. My Periscope app on my phone just quit. And so it can't get on Periscope on my phone anymore for whatever reason. So I had to switch to doing Facebook to my laptop. But anyway, I know y'all don't care about all that. But anyway, I was just telling you what's going on. Okay? So it's just been, uh, as usual, you know, every time the enemy is, uh, every time you're about to get a breakthrough or God is trying to reward you or God is trying to graduate you, or God is trying to get you to the next level, or God is trying to get you to a new flow of blessing, the devil's going to come at you hard. He's going to come at you all out. And so many times that includes him getting in, you know, as much as your stuff, as much as, as, much of your business uh, as possible, and uh, trying to mess you up. Okay. So let's dive right into today's prophetic word. And we're going to start with my motto. And my motto is, God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his prophets. Okay? All right. Now, I'm going to say that one more time for the people that are just now joining me. Again, today's broadcast, uh, Sunday, September 16th, 2.30 p.m. Uh, live on Facebook Live in Periscope, and my motto, my tagline is, God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his prophets. Okay, so for those of you that are coming on now, please like and share, um, because the more times you like something and the more times you share it, uh, especially on Facebook in particular, it helps the Facebook algorithm to get it out to people to let them know that I'm live or, you know, enable them to find me so they can um, hear the prophetic word. <clears throat> okay, uh, for those of you that want to make donations to my ministry, there's a paypal.me link on every Facebook Live post, and then it's also on my Periscope, Periscope profile, and it's on my Twitter feed, and then also you can, there's an Amazon Smile link, so that means you can choose Prophet David Taylor NFP as a charity you'd like to donate to if you want a, a portion of your Amazon purchases to go towards the charity, Okay. Best way to, uh, to find me online, I always hashtag everything I do with the hashtag PDT. So that's always the best way to find me. Regular broadcast is Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is now. And second Thursdays are No More Genies, 7 o'clock p.m. Now, I missed this last Thursday because I was uh, at an author signing. So I'm going to post that video later because I am going to do my next installment in No More Genies. Uh, it's actually installment number five. But I wasn't able to do it live Thursday because I was at a author signing uh, for most of the evening. But I will get that video in place, so don't worry. Okay? All right, great. So let's dive into today's word. Today's word is <clears throat> look and live. Look and live. Okay, let's do a quick word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time. Please uh, be with me, oh God. Please fill my mouth. Uh, please speak through me by the power of your spirit and your word, O oh God, so that what you have for the body of Christ will be disseminated, that you might be glorified, we might be edified, and the wicked might be terrified. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today's subject is entitled, Look and Live. Our scripture reference is Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Okay. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading out of the NIV version, the New International Version, and it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. 
But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, now there is a lot to unpack. I cannot possibly exegete all of that because that's a lot of uh, scripture to exegete. That's a lot of scripture to unpack. So I'm going to focus on uh, the thing that the Holy Spirit wants me to focus on. And again, our, our title today, our prophetic word today is Look and Live. So here's what I want to focus on. Let's look at those first three verses. The Lord says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? Now, also that word there, angel, could also be, it's translated angel in English, but it could also be translated messenger. So most commentators, most scholars agree that Jesus is talking to the pastor of the church. So when it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, a better translation might be to the pastor or the messenger or the shepherd of the church in Ephesus, okay? So they did translate that word angel, but in the original Greek, it's closer to messenger. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Okay. Let me give you some basic foundation. When you read the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three, what that is, is Jesus Christ giving grades to the church. One more time, Jesus Christ giving grades to the church. Now, one of the things that can tend to happen in our religious backgrounds is if you've ever studied judgment, because I found out a lot of Christians don't even study judgment. But if you've ever studied judgment, then a lot of Christians get this idea that judgment only happens after you die. Okay, that's not true. There is a very particular judgment that happens after you die. For Christians, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where we as believers go before the Lord, and the Lord has the totality of our lives before him written down and recorded in, in a book. And so the Lord opens the book of your life and the Lord judges you from birth till death on everything you said, everything you did, and everything that was in your heart when you did it. <clears throat> That's the judgment seat of Christ. And God is going to reward you or punish you based on the deeds and words written in the book of your life. But that's after you die. That's not the only judgment, okay? Jesus Christ speaks judgment from heaven right now. Everything with God is right now. So what the Lord does is he gives us our grades as we go along. That's why you need a prophetic word. Because a lot of Christians I've discovered don't know how to ask the Lord for their grades. Do you really want to live your whole life only to discover at the end that you were wrong? Do you really want to live your whole life feeling like you were pleasing God? Thinking you did a bunch of religious things? Thinking you did a bunch of good works? And then you die and you actually stand before Jesus Christ. And he says, well, all that didn't count. He says, depart from me. He says, I never knew you. We were never intimate. Is that really what you want? See, I don't think so. Okay. And the Lord doesn't think so either. So the Lord gives us grades. He gives us his judgments now. And a lot of Christians don't even know that you can ask the Lord for your grades now. You don't have to wait till you die. That's what Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 are about. The Lord is speaking to the seven churches in those cities, but he's also showing us his judgment function now that he has ascended into heaven, is on the right hand of God, uh, and is mediating the new covenant that he died to seal, uh, died to give us, and he sealed with his own blood. One of his functions as the risen Savior and the mediator and as the Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is to judge us. Because he's the head of the church. He's the head and we're his body. So it makes all the sense in the world that the head of the church wants to let the church know how we're doing. I'm going to say it one more time. Do you really want to live to be 98 years old and then you die and you thought you lived a good life? You thought you lived a godly life and then you're stepping before the Lord and he's just shaking his head like, nope. 
What are you going to do then? You can't live over. It's too late. Okay? This is why you have to read the Word of God for yourself. That's why I say it almost every time I teach. You have to study the Scriptures for yourself. Okay? And the Scripture teaches us in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, that Jesus Christ gives grades now, in the now, in the present, right now, so you can find out how you're doing as a Christian. Okay? <clears throat> so let's look at the Lord. The Lord has a lot of compliments for the church in Ephesus, or to the angel of the church, the messenger, the pastor, the shepherd. He's got a lot of compliments. Okay? So don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't please God. Yes, you can, because the Lord starts out his grading sheet. You know how when you're in elementary school or junior high or high school, you get your report cards and you get those grading sheets and you have all your classes and all your papers and all this stuff. You see check, check, or check minus, or check plus, or A, B, A minus, all that different kind of stuff. Well, that's what the Lord is doing here. And so he has a lot of compliments. He goes, these are the words of him who holds seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven in the lamb's hands. So right off the him that he's the head of the church, uh, that the seven stars are the messengers and the seven golden lampstands are the church. So in other words, the Lord is ahead and he holds his pastors, he holds his people, he holds his churches in his hands, and he walks among the lampstands. So in other words, the Lord is always walking among our churches, seeing how we're doing. Whether or not he's pleased with what he sees, you know a lot of Christians don't believe that. If Jesus was in your church service this morning, you probably would have acted differently unless you're used to being in the presence, and then you would have been like, great, because the Lord is there in, through the Holy Spirit. But I mean, if he was physically, bodily there, a whole lot of Christians would act completely differently. It's okay, but the Lord said he is there. Just because he's invisible doesn't mean he's not there. He said he walks among the seven golden lampstands. The golden lampstands represent the churches. Okay? So listen to his compliments. He says, I know your deeds. The Lord says, I know what you're doing. Then he says, your hard work. Wow. What a thing for Jesus Christ. Is that Jesus Christ said, I know you're working hard. Then he says, and your perseverance. In other words, you've been hanging in there. You've been persevering. You haven't given up. You haven't quit. Then he says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. Wow. So in other words, the Lord says that you're not compromising with wicked people. You're not saying, you know, I want a little bit, of, the old folks used to call that one foot in the world, one foot in the church. I want a little bit of the spirit and a little bit of flesh, a little bit of holy living and a little bit of worldly living. The Lord said, no, you cannot tolerate wicked people. You're not trying to compromise with people that aren't living for God, but are actively living against God. The Lord said, you can't tolerate them. Then he said, you've tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. So in other words, you're not just listening to people who stand up and claim to be an apostle, because you know they call Chicago the land of a, a thousand apostles. <laughs> they really do. Because uh, Chicago's a land of a thousand music producers, a thousand artists, and a thousand apostles. But anyway, so the Lord said, you test the people who claim they're apostles, but they're not. And it found them false. Now, there's a clue how you're not supposed to just swallow things because people say them. He said, you have persevered. He used that word again, persevered. The Lord says, I know that you're hanging in there. Then he says, and have endured hardships for my name. So in other words, you're trying to stay faithful to Christ, and you've, grown, you, you've gone through some hard things because of it. Like there might have been some times you want to cut some people out, but you didn't because you love the Lord. And about a bit, sometimes you wanted to cheat, cheat on your spouse, cheat on your taxes, cheat on a test, but you didn't because you love the Lord. And there might have been a time where somebody deeply offended you and you want to just, you know, give them a piece of your mind or you just want to write them off. You didn't want to fellowship with them anymore, but you didn't. And it's really hard when you're hurt. When you're hurt and you have to love through your hurt, that's really hard. Okay? But but you know, the Lord said you endure, or maybe persecution. Maybe somebody's just making their business to make your life miserable. Like they go out of their way to make your life miserable because you love the Lord. The Lord said you endure those hardships. And then he says, and have not grown weary. So in other words, you haven't gotten weary and well doing. The Lord says, I see that you're not tired. I see that you're hanging in there. Now, those are a lot of compliments for the Lord to say. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. You can't tolerate wicked people. 
you tested false apostles, you continue to persevere, you endure hardships for my name, and you haven't grown weary. Wow. What a bucket of compliments from the Lord Jesus Christ. But then <laughs> he says this. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. <clears throat> In King James, it says, yet I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Oh, what does that mean? What exactly will, what does the Lord mean when he says that? I'll tell you what he means. I want you to think about, I want you to think back about the first time you fell in love with a person. Or think about the first love of your life. How was it with them? It was like a constant state of euphoria. You were always smiling, always happy, always giggling. You always had something to talk about. You always wanted to be around them. You never got tired of their presence. You always had good things to say, and things were, were wonderful. I mean, the infatuation stage of a relationship, the beginning stage of a relationship, those are some of the best feelings that God ever made. That's why we love them so. Well, the Lord is saying to us, he wants that with us, because it's like that when you first get saved, if you think about it, when you, first get, when you first got saved, you couldn't wait to get to church. When you first got saved, you couldn't wait to read your Bible. When you first got saved, you couldn't wait to talk to the Lord. You couldn't wait to go into prayer. And you knew God was going to answer you too, like that. You couldn't wait to spend time in, in his presence. You couldn't wait to pour out your heart to Jesus because you loved the Lord so much because somebody told you that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was arrested, that he was beaten, spit upon, caned, whipped and then brutally murdered and hung on the cross for six hours. They beat, they beat Jesus up so badly until he didn't look like a human. If you had seen Jesus when he actually died, it's not like the pictures that you see now. You would have not have said, who is that? You would have said, what is that? They beat Jesus up so badly he didn't look human anymore. So somebody came and told you the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ that you could be saved because he died on the cross for your sins. And you said, yes, Lord. And you accepted him as your savior. And you were so excited, you didn't know what to do. You remember that feeling? Well, the Lord is saying he wants us to have that feeling back. He wants us to get that love relationship, the joy of our salvation, that giddy feeling, that excitement that we feel when when we're talking to him or about him or coming to his presence or also remember how when you first got saved, you told everybody you knew you were saved. <laughs> you couldn't wait to witness. You couldn't wait to testify. Old school, I don't know if they do it anymore, but they used to have testifying portions of the service. And in some churches had testimony services. Like all you did was testify. And people would stand up. You could wait to stand up and talk about what great things the Lord has done for me. You remember that? Well, the Lord is saying that when we lose that with him, he doesn't like it. He holds that against us. So in other words, the Lord is saying all them compliments, all that hard stuff you're going through, all that hanging in there, all that testing, the Lord said, that's good, but I got this against you. You don't love me like you used to. You're not excited about me like you used to be. You don't talk about me. You don't draw close to my presence. You're not excited about our relationship like you once were. Wow. That lines up with Matthew 7, 24. In other words, the Lord is saying he knows and understands all the stuff you're doing for him, and he knows and understands all the stuff you're going through because of him. But that doesn't mean anything to him if you don't love him. Well, you say, are you sure about that? Of course I'm sure. Can you prove that? Of course I can. Mm -hmm. What if your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife comes home and says, thanks so much for working all week. Thanks so much for cooking for me. Thanks so much for taking care of the kids. Thanks so much for paying the bills. Thanks so much for cleaning the house. Thanks so much for taking all the phone calls. Thanks so much for running the family business. Thanks so much for mowing the lawn. Thanks so much for cleaning the garage. Thanks so much for painting the back porch. But they don't give you no kiss. Good God Almighty, I know I'm telling the truth. 
They say, thanks for all that stuff you're doing, but they ain't got no kiss for you. How you feel? They say, thanks for all that stuff you're doing, but they won't hug you. They won't embrace you. They show you no affection. They list all the stuff you're doing right. I, I'm giving you compliments. I see all the stuff you're doing. They ain't got no, no affection for you. No kiss, no hug. How does that make you feel? See? See? See how that makes you feel? In spite of all the stuff that they're doing, if they're not excited to see you, if they're not excited to be around you, if they don't crave you, if they don't want you, if they don't long to be in your presence, you say all that other stuff is good, but we still got an issue because you don't love me like you used to. You don't want me. You don't crave me. You're not excited about me. That's what the Lord is saying in that passage of scripture. Okay? And I know some people have a hard time like that. That's why I do my no more genie thing. But you hear me say it all the time. God is a person, not a set of rules. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, our preacher this morning, uh, Deacon Philip, uh, one of the great uh, young deacons uh, in our church, preached this morning about um, your first love and about how much you love the Lord and being excited and all that. And I've noticed that there's a flow in the day of what the Holy Ghost is saying. I've noticed many times that <clears throat> I've listened to different preachers and I've listened to morning sermons and I listen to other people and I see a thread in what the Lord is saying out of the mouths so many different people, and I hear the Lord saying the same thing. And when the Holy Ghost gave me this word, I see so many similarities because the Lord is saying that all that we do for him is great, and he sees it, and all that we endure for him is great, and he sees it. But if we don't love him, okay, it's the same way you feel, like I just said, for a hardworking spouse that doesn't give you any affection or act like they're happy to see you when you show up. Where do you think we get that from? How can you say you believe that we're made in God's image and you don't understand that about God? God is a person, not a set of rules. And God wants you to love him the same way your lover wants you to love him. Now that's supposed to be your married lover, you say. If you say you ain't supposed to be living for an occasion, you ain't supposed to be living with somebody you ain't married to. Let me hurry up and say that, because we're not supposed to be shocking. Romans 13, 13, we're not supposed to be chambering. That's what that means. If you're married, <clears throat> your spouse is your lover. And if your lover has no affection for you, your lover is not excited to see you, your lover is not excited about you, it will matter how hard you work, will it? It doesn't matter how hard they work, does it? See? So, so why is that relevant to us today? That's relevant to us today because that's the message of the Lord today. I don't know why that message has been so strong, but the Lord is saying to his children, in spite of all we're going through, in spite of all we've endured, in spite of all the fighting, because you know, and I'm gonna tell you, you can get really tired of fighting the devil. You can fight the devil so much, you get tired of fighting. Now, even if you get some strength and you don't get weary and well doing it, you keep going. After a while, see, you need to win. <laughs> you can't just have continual battle and that don't wear you down. You got to win, okay? But you can fight the devil so long and so hard and try to stand on your faith and try to stand on the word and take out the shield of faith to block his fiery darts, take out the sword of the spirit to shove the word of God down his throat. You do that for so long, it can wear you out. And the Lord is saying, even when you're doing that, I want you to love me. That it don't count if you don't have any affection for the head of the church because God is a person. He has a soul. He has feelings. He's not a set of rules. And just like you want your lover to be excited about you, God wants us to be excited about him. <clears throat> the reason that's so important is because I know there's a lot of people um, who have had very rough summers, because I'm one of them. And I know there's a lot of people who have had very rough uh, the last two months of your life, the last nine weeks of your life. The last summer has just been, sometimes it's felt like hell, a living hell. Like you felt like you, you died and went to hell. Like I done messed up because I'm in hell now, because that's how rough it's been. But the Lord is saying he wants us to come back to loving him. 
in spite of all that, come back to loving him, come back to affection, come back to, to being close, come back to excitement, come back and get the joy of your salvation back. That's the message of the Lord today. So I want to say that to everybody who's tired and everybody who's fighting and everybody that's enduring and everybody that's doing all the stuff he said. The Lord has given us a compliment on our work, but he wants us to love him again like we did at the beginning. Okay? That's the prophetic word for today. All right. Now, uh, does anybody have any prayer requests? If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen, and I'll pray for them. If not, we'll do a closing prayer. And remember, like I said, I did this my No More Genies this past Thursday because I was at an uh, author signing and that ran uh, much longer than I thought it was going to be, so I didn't get a chance to do it live. But I will post that video later because I do have my fifth installment for uh, No More Genies, so that will be going up later. Okay? Any prayer requests? Okay. All right, then we're going to pray a closing prayer, and I want to remind you, once again, to no matter what you're going through, Take time to fall in love with the Lord again because that is his message from heaven. He doesn't just want your service. He wants your heart. He doesn't just want your body. He wants your love. All right? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you for this prophetic word. Thank you for your written word. Thank you, O oh God, that you have called us to love you and that you love us. And even as as Deacon Philip was talking about this morning, how the very uh, hairs on our head are numbered, but you obsess over 